evening. Open your Bibles up to the book of 2 Corinthians uh, this evening, the, the chapter 12. We're looking at verses uh, 7 through 10. Um, I'm calling tonight's message, Afflicted by God. And you, you hear that title or you see it on the screen and you're, you're probably uh, not very excited. You, you, that's, that's, that's not really what I want to hear about tonight. Uh, but I, that doesn't excite me to, to hear about being afflicted by God. But what, what I want us to, to, to do, don't just focus on the, the being afflicted by God. It's the, it's the why. Right. Right? The, 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 the why or, or the what that goes along with that affliction. Uh, because that's the age-old question, right? That, that we've had ourselves and maybe you've had people in your life when, when tragedy strikes. Uh, and and the, the question is always, you know, why, why did this happen? If God is so good and if God loves us, then, then why does he allow bad things to happen? Or more specifically, even in the church, you start to wonder why does God allow bad things to happen to, to, to his own people, to God's people? Right? And so the, 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 those are real questions. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, it, what, what, what do you say to that? Right? You, want, you, want to, you want to quote Romans 8.28 to them then in that moment? Just barely suck it up. All things work for good for those who are... are know God and are called according to his purposes, that's not, that's not helpful. Right? And so there's some mystery here, but there is a purpose behind everything that happens, everything that God allows to happen. There's, there's a reason behind all of these things, that bad things happen to everyone, right. even to the people that love Jesus, sometimes even more so. Amen? That's right. They experience more difficulties and, and more affliction. The Bible tells us that it rains on the just and the unjust. Right? That there, there, there's not, it's not always just one or the other. That God's people are not exempt from suffering and loss. God's people are not exempt from all types of afflictions. We know this. We, we live down here where we get hurricanes and, and tornadoes. And we know. And so we, we've seen this. That uh, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes will, uh, will wipe a, a, a whole community out and just wash everything away. Uh, we know that... Uh, Tornadoes and hurricanes, they don't, they don't bypass Christians' houses. Do you, know, you ever notice that? It doesn't, doesn't go around. In fact, sometimes it's the Christian's home that gets demolished and, and, and not the unsaved person, right? right? And so we can't always point to any of these events and say, well, we, we know why that happened or why this didn't happen. I, I remember when Katrina, when Katrina came and, and flooded New Orleans. What, what was everyone saying? What was all these super spiritual church folks saying? about Katrina. Remember that? That's God's judgment. That's God's judgment on the city. Oh, really? Well, did you know that Bourbon Street was dry as a bone? That's right. <laughs> right? Like the heart of darkness in New Orleans, right? The, the French Quarter, all that area down there was, was basically high and dry. And so we can't always make that association with things, and it's just not wise to do that. We, we know that even as the people of God, uh, our kids are born with disabilities and diseases just like everyone else. That's right. right. We're not spared from these things. Right? Biblically speaking, we should expect to suffer afflictions of some sort. It's part of being alive. It's part of existing uh, on, a, on a planet that's just wracked by sin. We're, we're sinners and we live in a fallen world, and so we should expect these things to come. But sometimes we suffer as a direct consequence for our sin. A direct consequence. Con sin has consequences, right? We, we understand that. Do we also think that we could live like we want in rebellion against God and there not be any consequence to our actions? We know there are eternal consequences, but there are also immediate consequences in certain times. We know that life can be a real struggle. But you know what? That, that was not God's original plan. That wasn't his design. This, 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 the world we live in now is not how God had planned things to work. If we go back again, as I referred to this morning, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, the garden, perfect, perfection. Beauty, no sin, no fire ants, no mosquitoes, <laughs> right? No humidity, <laughs> just as pleasant as can be. So it wasn't supposed to be this way. This is, this is what we see now, the struggles we experience we have nobody to blame but ourselves. It's, this is because of sin. It's because of our of humanity's sinfulness. Even nature has been 
affected. That's why we do have earthquakes. That's why we have tornadoes and hurricanes and wildfires and all these things. It wasn't that wasn't part of the original deal. That's not what God had planned. It's because of the fall. We know this. Romans 8, 19 through 22 tells us, says, for the new, for the for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subject, subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. This isn't the way it was supposed to be. This isn't the world that, that God intended for us to inhabit. But also, sometimes, I keep emphasizing sometimes, because I don't want you to just lock into one thing and say, this is, this is the way it is. This, there's lots of reasons that we suffer and uh, face affliction. Sometimes, as Christians, we suffer because God is disciplining us as a father would discipline his children. That's right. Sometimes that's what's going on, right? Uh, whenever God does this to us, the point of it is corrective. Right. It's not punitive, right? It's not... It's not that we're being punished per se, it's, it's to correct us, right? Because we know that we're not being punished for our sins. Jesus was punished for our sins. That's right. And it would be unjust for God to punish us as well. That Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. It's, all, it's always about correction whenever we uh, are under the, the discipline of God. And when he disciplines us, his goal is to get us back on the path of righteousness. But to help us to, to get our, our heads and our hearts right and, and, and going back in the proper direction to continue to be more and more like Christ. That we're called to be holy and God will enable us to live the type of lives that he's called us to live. Amen? Right. That, that, that's the whole goal of this. And, and lastly, uh, I would say that sometimes as Christians, God will allow us to be afflicted to shape us and to help us to grow in our faith. And what I'm saying is sometimes affliction is actually good for us. It's actually good for us, as odd as that, that, that might seem. And I believe that's the kind of affliction that we will see in our passage tonight. That we can learn a lot about ourselves and about God when we're going through a time of affliction. Amen? Amen. We learn a lot of things about ourselves. We learn a lot of things about our friends. Right. We learn a lot of things about our family, right? We think about the book of Job. That's a great example about you find out a lot about yourself and you also find out a lot about the people that you have around you. And so as we look at this, this, this passage tonight in 2 Corinthians, you're familiar with 2 Corinthians or the Corinthian church, so most of you are, but for those of, it, of you who are not, uh, Corinth was a mess. The church of churches of Corinth was a, a mess and they were, uh, I always think of the church in Corinth as being uh, Paul's problem child. They, they were always having some dysfunction and there was always some type of disunity. There was always something going on. Uh, the, 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 the city itself was, was just, just, uh, just deep in sexual immorality and, and deep in all types of uh, worship of false gods and temples and all type of paganism that's going on. Uh, they had their share of false prophets and, and, and these false prophets were, were scamming people and taking advantage of people and uh, uh, robbing them of their money and, and, and promising and not delivering on things and, and it being uh, false apostles and accusing Paul of actually being the false apostle when it was actually them instead. So there's all these things that were happening and, and it seemed as though in, in, in Corinth uh, the, the people were, were, were uh, fascinated uh, uh, by uh, uh, these men who seemed to be gifted speakers. They were just, they, they were just drawn to them like 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 you know like uh, uh, flies to honey or, or whatever bees to honey whatever whatever the saying is they they were attracted to them and and so the, these men that were, were were great speakers gifted speakers philosophers uh, uh, those that were gifted in the art of debate man that's what the people just just loved them they put them up on pedestals and and, and we see this and and so what's odd is that being the case and and we know, what we know about Paul is Paul wasn't exactly uh, well spoken and he wasn't really great at articulating what he was saying right he had a brilliant mind but he didn't have a he wasn't smooth talking he was, he was kind of rough around the edges of his speech and so he wouldn't really fit into what what these people 
were looking for. In fact, many of them refused to recognize Paul as an apostle. And if they don't recognize him as an apostle, they won't recognize his authority either. And so that's where a lot of these issues arise from. That many in the churches there were were downright hateful to Paul. And many of them were even disrespectful of, of Paul, as, it, as it's hard for us to get our minds around, the way we have such reverence and such respect for, for Paul. I mean, he's the one that's responsible for the majority of our New Testaments, and so it's hard for us to connect with what was happening there. And then Paul could have got fed up. He could have easily just, uh, you know, just, just, just either thrown up his, uh, thrown up his hands and, and just, just, just walked away and just kind of left them to their own thoughts. Or Paul could have or simply just brought up his own resume of confidence. He said, y'all y'all like great deeds? Y'all, 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 like the, y'all have respect for people with lots of accomplishments? Let me tell you about mine. Let me share my list with you. And you see, Paul wasn't going to do that. He, he wasn't interested with trying to, to sway them with what the world thinks greatness is. He wasn't interested in doing that. Paul had no interest in appealing to their worldliness. He was not interested in catering to their flesh. That he had to fight this same battle in some of the other churches. And, and like in, even in Philippi, the church that he, that he loved and the one that was special to him, he still had to deal with these same antagonists everywhere that he went to Judea. Listen to what he wrote in Philippians 3, 4 to 6. He says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he's like, you, you want to compare greatness? You want to compare resumes? He said, look at this. Look, look at what I, I have uh, to, to show you. But we also know that, that God worked through uh, Paul in significant ways. We know because it's recorded for us in scriptures. We know that God worked through him in significant ways, but we also know that God allowed Paul to experience some things that were unique to him, right? Unique to him and, and to his calling, things that, that, that could have caused him to become prideful, right? We think about some of the miraculous things that, that Paul was allowed to do and, and to be a part of. Uh, I mean, I, 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 it's a blessing and a privilege to be able to, to preach and proclaim proclaim God's word, but God has not saw fit to allow me to just to walk by and touch someone and have them uh, be miraculously cured and uh, the cancer just, just leave their body or, or, or take one of my handkerchiefs, right, and, and, and do the same thing. But, but, but with Paul, he used them again in unique ways and special ways to, to do these things and, 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 and lots of opportunities for him to become prideful. But God loved Paul too much to let him do that. He loved Paul too much uh, to, to be prideful. That he loved Paul too much and understood that his ministry to the Gentiles was far too important to be hindered because of his pride. So guess what God did? God afflicted him. That's right. God gave him some form of affliction. And so that's what we'll see in our text this evening. And with God's help, we'll learn to experience the same benefits that Paul did when God allows affliction into our lives. And so this will be quite helpful for us, I believe, if we can apply its truths to our lives. And so let's grab our Bibles now, if you're able, and let's stand together in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're actually going to start in verse 1 of chapter 12, but we're going to focus again on verses 7 through 10. Verse 1 says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will, I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. 
And here's our text. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I, become, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that I, the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is God's word. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. We, we look to him and we look to his faithfulness. And God, we aspire. We aspire to have that, that same faith, to, to be as faithful as the Apostle Paul was. And God, I pray that you help us to understand a little better tonight. When we face difficulties, when we face tribulations and trials and when suffering comes and when afflictions enter into our lives that we would not despair mm -hmm. but our faith would grow mm -hmm. and that we would understand that, that you have a plan and a purpose for everything no no matter what it might be no matter how hard it might be no matter how tragic it might be that you have a plan and you have a purpose so god we ask that you would increase our faith tonight as we study your word we love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We've got three benefits that we'll see in our text tonight. And the first benefit that we see is that affliction keeps us humble. It keeps us humble. Look again at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure. By the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now I know we have quite a few uh, animal lovers in the room. I know we have a few people that, that look at their pets as, as if they were people. And so I'm sensitive to that, but I'm going to ask this question anyway, because some of y'all, you'll know, the, the analogy is good, it's a good illustration, so don't, don't, don't pull me aside later and, and scorn and, and, and give me a hard time about what I'm about to say. Oh, y'all know what sh shock collars are? <laughs> right? The, I, 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 know, I know Junior knows. Do you have a few? Have you used them, have you used them on your dog? Do you still do? Still do. You're quite, quite effective? <laughs> he says yes there, there, there are these collars with electrodes that are, are built into them to help uh, train dogs uh, to, to be obedient uh, if a dog has a, a barking problem zap right? and, and it helps to alleviate that dog, the dog is overly aggressive keeps charging people keeps jumping up on you zap right? it, it, it kind of gets it makes sense. Charlie, you want to order one? Like, where do you get these things? <laughs> look, I've, I've seen, you can look it up on YouTube, uh, some, some people, for, I don't know why they would do it, they, they put it on themselves just to see what it felt like. And oh. Their friends, again, friends, be careful who your friends are. Exactly. And their friends would control it, and they say, here, let's try it out, and of course they would never let off, and they'd make it worse. And anyway, um, if your dog's stubborn, give them a little zap. But what they're, they're used for is to train dogs and to help to keep dogs in line. And I think about sometimes what God will do for us, that he will allow us to be afflicted for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. He'll allow afflictions to, 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 to keep us in line. That's what I believe here, that, that, that God gave Paul some type of thorn in the flesh to help keep him in line, to help keep him humble, right? Because he had seen this, this great vision, right? And so he, he, he wanted to help him to, to not... Uh, 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 become too prideful. Uh, uh, a messenger of Satan was given to him to buffet him, the text says, to, to keep him humble lest he become prideful because of the heavenly vision that he has seen. And so we're always reading this text and we're always speculating, we're always wondering what was this thorn in the flesh. And truth be told, we don't know. You know why we don't know? Because the Bible doesn't tell us. 
We're, we're not told what it is. Right? If, if, it really was, if it really mattered, we would know what it is. But it doesn't. That's not the point. The thorn's not the issue. It's the, it's the reason for the thorn. Right? That, that we're, we're not told what it was, and so all we can do is speculate. Some Bible scholars tend to think that it could have been some type of a, a physical disability. You know, other parts of Scripture where we see, I believe it was the Galatians maybe, the ones that were talking about, they would have pulled out their own eyes and given to him. So it may have been something, it could have been something with his, his vision. We're, we're, we don't know. And some think it was some type of a chronic illness or, 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 or something along those lines. And, and, but, but I think if we just deal with our text, and it's always good for us to deal with what the text says, right? And what we have in front of us. Uh, the, the text tells us, uh, it could have been some, some form of, of demonic oppression, right? Because the, the, the word messenger in the Greek word is, 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 is angelos, which of course means angel, right? Angel, a messenger. It's very likely that the chief opponent of Paul in Corinth was being influenced by a demonic spirit for the sole purpose of oppressing Paul, afflicting him, tormenting him, uh, just, just, just harassing him at every turn. We see this happen. Sometimes demonic oppression is sanctioned by God to accomplish his will. Mm -hmm. His will. Right? And, and some of us are saying, I don't, man, what, I'm not sure about that. And some of you are thinking, so you're telling me that God will use demons to accomplish his purposes? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm, I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what the Bible says for itself. That's what we see here. I believe in, our, in this text. It's what the entire book of Job is about. Right? It, it, over and over again we see this. It's, it's what we see in Peter, with Peter in, in Luke 22, 31 to 34, when he was boasting. Remember he was bragging about how he would, no matter what happened, he would stand with Jesus. No matter what comes his way. And, and listen, listen to what, 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 what Jesus says here in Luke 22, 31 to 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. Huh? What you see right there? Asking, asking that, that he could have his way. But the but good thing that Peter has Jesus as a prayer partner. Yes. Right? But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned, that when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am, ready to go, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you even know me. So we see this, right? This, this isn't me kind of overhyping or reading into the text. It's, it's true that, that God will even employ demonic forces to, to, to afflict us, to keep us humble. John MacArthur puts it this way. He said, this is a good reminder of the foolishness of those who try to tell Satan and demons what to do and where to go. Hmm. Right? You're, you're getting around like they always say, you know, get behind me, Satan. Right? I, 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 uh, I, uh, uh, what is it? Flee from me or, or, or I banish you or whatever. We don't have that type of authority. That's right. Right? We just talked about being little gods. That's right. Right? We're, we're not, big gods are little gods. That, that, that Christ is the one who has this authority. And MacArthur went on to say, if we could command demons, we might thwart the purposes of God with our faulty assumptions. Right? By, by us, if, if we could actually stop demons from, from doing the things they're doing, we, we might be able to, to hinder what God is trying to do in us through them. Mm. Through their afflictions and through what they're trying to, to do. You see, the problem with us is we get prideful and God will not share his glory with anyone. That's right. He will not share his glory with anyone, not even with us as people. All that Paul accomplished and would accomplish in his life was because of God. Not only was it because of God, it was for God. Mm -hmm. It was all for God's glory and not for, for Paul's. All that we accomplish in life and will accomplish is because of God. And it should be for God's glory and not for ours. So it's not about it's not about being awesome. It's not about being great and drawing attention to yourself. It's all about us pointing to Him and giving Him praise and giving Him glory. When, when people are trying to, to, to thank us, and I understand there's a place for, for, for receiving thanks and, and being grateful, but so many times we say it was it was my pleasure. 
It's my pleasure, and I'm just I'm just grateful that God allowed me to be used by, by Him to meet this need for you. And so if you want to praise someone, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for what, what He has accomplished. You see, every time that we grow prideful, what we're doing is, is we are inviting affliction into our lives. You want to be afflicted? Start becoming prideful. Start, start developing a, a, a haughty spirit. Start, start talking about yourself a lot and, and, and how great you are and how awesome you are and, and how necessary you are to your, uh, your business or, or to your church or whatever it is and see what happens. Right. See what comes your way. But these afflictions will come not to harm us, but to humble us. Right. Not to harm us, but to humble us. That God will do whatever is necessary to get our eyes back on him. He's either willing to unleash demons against us if that's what it'll take. If that's what it'll take, that's exactly what he'll do. Luke 14 11 says, for what, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Sometimes sometimes God allows us to be afflicted to keep us humble. Amen? Right. To keep us humble. The second benefit that we see in the text is that affliction keeps us praying. Keeps us praying concerning this thing. <laughs> this thing. Fill in the blank. This thing. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. <clears throat> how, is your, how strong is your prayer life? Right? How, how persistent are you willing to be in your prayers until God gives you an answer? From personal experience, I, I think that we tend to give up rather quickly. If God doesn't answer us right away, we, we kind of fade. But again, we're that, that's the culture we live in. We, we want everything now. That's right. right? Instantly. We, huh? Instant gratification, right? That, that we, we want it yesterday. All right, we got stuff nowadays, Amazon Prime or whatever you want, you can, the very next day, you click it in, you buy it, credit card, bang, it's at your door the next day. Well, why can't God, if Amazon can do it, why can't God do it? <laughs> right? It, Amazon even can do it 24 hours. Why can't God answer my prayers like that or even faster? He's God. God has a plan. Right. and a purpose for everything he does. If he's delaying, there's a reason for his delay. Amen. If he's denying, there's a reason for his denial. It's not, he's not a genie. We can't just rub our Bibles and just poof, there it is. It's not the way that it works. But most of us give up too quickly in our prayers. Now to be clear, as we look at what we see in our text here, uh, Paul didn't stop praying for God to take away the thorn after three prayers. He didn't pray three prayers and then he stopped. Paul stopped praying because God answered his prayers after the third time. Now, does that always happen? No. Again, unique. This is a, a unique example that we see in Scripture. He stopped because God answered his prayers. And guess what God's answer was to the great apostle? Surely, surely God would not tell Paul no exactly what he did. He told Paul, no. In this instance, God even gave an explanation because most, from my experience, I, when, when, when God tells me no, I don't, I don't get an explanation. Right? I can, I can kind of guess about why he would say no or, or maybe the way circumstances turn out after the fact, I can kind of, oh, now I see now I see why he told me no. That makes sense. Yeah, God's smart. He knows what I would do. I think back before I left uh, construction, and I had a, I was working as a general foreman, and a position come up for, for a supervisor, a truck driving supervisor. And I was like, man, it's my time. It's my time. You know, I even though I knew I was, I was going to be going to seminary, um, uh, and I thought for sure, I thought for sure that was, that was my position. Uh, the, the, the supervisor I've been working for, my, my good friend, and uh, 
I just I just thought it was my my job to, to lose, you know, or, or to turn down. Oh no. I he didn't even he didn't even consider me. He gave that to someone else and boy I was mad. I was. I was swallowed up. I said, I cannot believe that that was my I'm, I'm your friend. I've been working under you for years and you this guy's not even from on your crew. How could you do that? And I was sitting there all swollen up and didn't want to talk to him for a few days and and just, you know, and God got a hold to me, you know, and it didn't, wasn't, it wasn't spelled out like this, but I, he's like, he's like, Mike, I know you. I know your heart. If I, if I, if I would have promoted you and give you that promotion, give you that truck, give you that money, there's a chance, there's a chance that you may not go to seminary. Hmm. Oh, no. Oh, that makes sense. That's why you said no. That's why you, you turned me down. That's why I didn't get that promotion. You, you understand what I'm saying? And I'm sure all of you have stories like that. You all, all have times in your life where a door closed and you were just, I don't understand it. That should have been me. That should have been me. But God had other things for us to do. So what was God's explanation to Paul? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This might come as a shock to some of you, but it shouldn't. God knows us better than we know ourselves. That's right. He knows our inward parts. He, he, he knows what motivates us. He knows what incentivizes us. He knows what's in that, that deepest recess of our hearts, places that we haven't even visited yet. He knows how we're going to respond in certain situations. He knows. And God also knows what we're going through, our situations. God knows that, our, that there are circumstances, some, that seem to be far beyond what we can handle, especially when he's the one that has allowed it to happen. <laughs> he's the one that's orchestrated all this. He's allowed this to happen, and he knows it's too much. And why would he do that? Why would he do that? So that we would be reminded of our dependence on him. That we need Him. That we need His strength. We need Him to, to carry us through. That we would be reminded of His goodness towards us even when our circumstances aren't good. Those people that like to, to, to be all spiritual. Now, and I think they're trying to encourage us or others when they say this, but they're not. Rest easy, my friend. God never gives us more than we can handle. That's not true. That's right. Biblically, it's not true. God's always giving us more than we can handle. He's always overwhelming us. Why? So we'll depend on Him. Amen. We'll depend on Him. We, ha we have to trust Him. Those people are wrong. When we feel anxious, when we feel overwhelmed, that God wants us to turn to Him in prayer. Again, Paul in Philippians, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, a, a, a section of Scripture that's been so meaningful to us, especially these last couple of years. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God knew Paul. He created Paul. He, he knows what's in his heart. He knows what's in his, what's in his head. And God knew that, that Paul was prone to becoming prideful. You, you, know, you know who Paul was before he got saved, right? You know what he was? Pharisee? Pharisee of Pharisees? Like one of the most prestigious positions that you can hold? You know how people treated him everywhere he walked? Anywhere he went, he, he got what he wanted. People bowed down. They respected him. They feared him. And so he knew what was in Paul's heart. This thorn in the flesh was an act of grace towards Paul. That God was teaching Paul that his grace was sufficient in any circumstance. And his strength was made perfect through Paul's being weak. This affliction. In his time of affliction. Paul did not need the adoration and applause of men. That's what the Corinthians, that's what the false apostles, that's what they wanted. They fed off of those things. Paul didn't need that. Paul didn't need to keep on flexing to show people how strong he was in the flesh. That was the old Paul. That was Saul. That was Saul of Tarsus. 
This is Paul the Apostle. He's been changed. That, 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 that old Paul died on the cross with Jesus. And if you've been saved, that old you died on the cross with Jesus too. And some of y'all need to hear that. That's right. That old you don't exist anymore. That old you is dead. You've been made a new creation. Just like Paul. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by, the, live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul was a new creation because of God's grace. And it's the same way for us. You and I are new creations too if we have trusted in Christ. You see, there's only one hero in the Bible. One. His name's Jesus. Amen. His name is Jesus. God's grace is never more visible in us than we when we are weak. Why do you think Jesus chose the disciples that he did in the beginning, the original apostles? Do you ever think about that? I mean, if I'm picking a team, that's probably not the guys I'm going for. But that's precisely who Jesus went after. He didn't go after the rich. He didn't go after the highly educated, the religious elite. No, he just chose 12 ordinary men. He did that to magnify how awesome God is, not how awesome men could be. That's right. Jesus took those 12 ordinary men, and the Bible says that they turned the world upside down. They turn the world upside down. You see, God's people are to be people of prayer. That's right. We know that. We're told to pray without ceasing. Right? right? To pray about everything. That's what we're told in Scripture. God's people are to be people that trust and believe that God's grace is sufficient. That, that we're to be people that trust in God's strength and not in our own in fact, it is only because of God's grace that we have everything that we need. That's what we see in 2 Peter 1, 2-4. Peter writes, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been have been given us to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so let me just ask you tonight, is God's grace sufficient for you? Is it? Is His grace sufficient for you? Is, is His strength being made perfect through your weakness? You see, if you're trying to be strong, and there's a place for strength. Don't hear, me, don't hear me saying that. There's no place for self-reliance. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Are, are, are you trying to be the hero? If you're, if you're trying to be the strong one, then, then God's not going to meet you in that. You're actually, you're, you're, you're inviting affliction. You're inviting him to humble you in this. Is this strength being made perfect through your weakness? Sometimes, God allows us to be afflicted to keep us praying. That's right. Amen? We know this, to keep us praying. And the third benefit that we see in the text is that affliction keeps us praising. It says, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs in persecutions and distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Some would read verse 10, and it would sound like Paul has a screw loose. Maybe that's what Paul's thorn was. He was mentally ill. Some type of a psychopath. Why in the world would somebody take pleasure in infirmities? Why would someone take pleasure in reproaches and in needs and persecutions and distresses? Why? Because he knew that God would meet him there. That's right. It caused 
Paul to give God glory. It caused God to give him praise. He could praise his way through these situations. Makes me think about us and when difficulties come. You know how many people are absent from our churches because of something bad happened in their lives? Not just in the church, right? We, we run off our share too, right? There's been some things happen and hurt feelings, words were said or whatever, and they, they'll use that and they won't come back. They won't go anywhere. That they're just disappointed. But I'm talking about tragedies. Something happened, and, and people get mad at God. Y'all know that. Y'all probably know people yourself. That something happened. And it just, it just kind of just shattered their understanding. Of who, I thought God loved me. I was, I was being faithful to God, and, and, then, and then God let this happen. How could God do this to me? How could God do that? How could God take my child? A deep hurt. I understand it. I, I, I could totally understand it. And many of you walk through these seasons, I understand. And I, and, I, and I am sympathetic towards that. But you're here. That's right. But you're here. You walk through these seasons and you're here. And God has showed himself faithful. And you still are able to give God praise. Now, you haven't fled from God. You've made your anxieties known. You've made your concerns known. You've made your hurts known. You've grieved. And God has met you in that grief. <coughs> But what I've noticed is, is there are a whole lot of fair weather followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. Fair weather followers of Christ. And what that is, is as long as everything is going well for you, you're good. You, you love Jesus. You'll, you'll come to church. You'll sing the songs. You'll be involved with the church. But let something go wrong. Let something happen. Let, let, let God not answer your prayer after the third time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get all swole up. I'm, I'm just done. I've done all this for you, and this is how you treat me. This you don't come through. All I've asked you for is this, and you said no. I don't. I don't understand this, and you just take your toys and go home. Do you only give God praise when things are going your way? When things are going your way, when life is good, is that the only time you give God praise, or do you praise God in the storm too? Fairweather fans are those fans of sports teams that only support the team when they're winning. Lots of Fairweather fans in Louisiana. <laughs> Lots of people have thrown their purple and gold in the trash. Lots of people are in the process of throwing their black and gold in the trash. This year. Not me. I'm a glutton for punishment. I'm not a Fairweather anything. I may be a lot of things, uh, but I don't lack commitment. That's, that's a, a strength and a weakness for me. Sometimes I, I don't know when to stop. I don't know when to let go. I think that's a good quality to have as a pastor, though. That's right. Otherwise, you'll be going to a new, new church every other year. <laughs> that's why some, some do. You won't, you, won't, you won't carry through. See, once we finally come to truly understand that by trusting Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are as fully loved and, and, and fully accepted as we will ever be by God, we cannot help but to give Him praise. That's right. Once we understand that we are completely loved and accepted, there's nothing there, he, God cannot love us any more than He does already. That's right. there, there is not another level of acceptance. You don't start out here and then you work your way through these progressions by being a, a more faithful Christian. You're accepted. You're loved as much as you ever will be. No, and you know yourself. You know that you're, you're like me. I, I know how I mess up. I know how I still sin. I know how I still disappoint God. And if it was me, if I was God, uh, there, there would be some type of a merit system. But there's not one with God. Once you place your faith in Christ, you are fully loved and you're fully accepted. No, no matter how you stumble along the way. That's a reason for praise. That's right. Praise God for that. Even in our infirmities, we can give God praise. Nothing and nobody can keep us from giving praise to our God. And that's why the Bible tells us that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Because if we're not careful, guess what? Our eyes will deceive us. That's right. 
Our, our circumstances will deceive us. If we begin to associate God's love and acceptance with us based off of our circumstances, that's great as long as life is good. That's great as long as everyone's healthy. That's great as long as you have a job and can pay your bills and all that. But what happens whenever you can't? What happens whenever you're not well? What's what happens when somebody's sick and somebody has serious illness? Then what? Then what happens? Then, oh, well, I guess God don't love me anymore. Then, then something's happened and no, no longer I, do I have God's favor. Maybe he doesn't accept me anymore. Something's wrong. Now be careful about that. If we're not careful, our circumstances can mislead us if we're not grounded in the principles and promises of God's Word. We need to know our our Bibles. Right. You know what God's Word says. Right. Paul knew that, that the key to releasing Christ's power into, uh, into his life was for him to keep boasting and to keep giving praise to Christ no matter what his circumstances were. And I've got to know in this room all of you pretty well. And I'm sure there's still some things I don't know about some of you and some things I probably will never know. Some things that you don't share with anyone. And I know that some of you have had some really hard lives. You've, you've, you've been through some, some tough things. And I'm not minimizing those things. But when I think about my life and, and your life, and I think about, about Paul's, and I think about the afflictions that I've experienced, you've, you've experienced, and I, and I look at Paul. And when you think about his afflictions, I mean, think about it. I mean, again, I'm not minimizing. I'm not saying that you have been through it and you've experienced some things. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that let's, let's look to Paul and just deal with our text and think about him and, and where he's coming from, from his perspective. Look, look at his manifesto of affliction. And this is just since he became a Christian. This isn't before. This is, this is after he accepted Christ. This is how his life changed. This, this is him having his best life now. All right, where's the prosperity preachers? Why aren't they, why aren't they sharing this? Right. They skip over this. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 11. This, this, is, this precedes our passage tonight. He says, In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in death, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. And I love 28. Besides the other things, <laughs> in case I forgot anything, Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. If you want to have a discussion about afflictions, if you want to have a pity party about your afflictions, don't have it with Paul. That's right. <laughs> don't have it with him. But you see, if Paul's faith was not grounded in the faithfulness of Christ, there is no way that he could have endured all that he did. No way. No way that he would have held on. No way he would have been able to persevere through all those things. See, as the people of God, we must never, never, never doubt the goodness of God. Amen. Even when bad things happen, God is still good. In sickness or in health, we must give God praise. In prosperity or in poverty, we must give God praise. In freedom or amidst persecutions, we must give God praise. We must take the good and the bad of life and give God praise, no matter what. That's right. No matter what. Sometimes God allows us to be afflicted to keep us praising. To keep us giving him praise. So tonight as we close. This life is hard. It's hard. It's harder for some than others. Suffering comes to all of us. At some point or another. If you haven't suffered yet. 
It's coming. It's coming. I'm not saying that to scare you or to, you know, to put a whammy on you. I mean, if, if something happens to you this week, don't blame it on the pastor. Right? And it's, it's not my fault. I didn't speak this over you, and that's why this happened. I'm just saying it happens to all of us. It's just part of living in a fallen world. It's, it's part of God's design for us. But from this day forward, when bad things happen, when times of affliction come, maybe we need to stop asking why. Especially if you're persistent in your sin. If you are up to your eyeballs in sin and disobedience to God, you don't need to ask God why you are being afflicted. If you're His, you're being disciplined. That's right. He's spanking that butt is what He's doing. He's wanting you to stop. He's trying to get your attention and turn around and, and, and stop doing what you're doing to repent and turn back to Him. That's not always the case. When I was dealing with my own affliction of stage 3 cancer, uh, I read a book by David Jeremiah that was called Abandon the Road. I recommend it uh, to all of you. It was very helpful for me uh, during that season. Uh, did you know that he's also a cancer survivor? Yes. He is. Uh, multiple. His cancer has come back on him a few times. In the book, he recommended, or he shared his own experience that he found himself questioning, like most of us do, why? Why is this happening to me? I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor of this big church, about David Jeremiah, this big church, and have all this influence, worldwide ministries, and people come to faith left and right, and just, want, you know, why? He could get no peace. And so eventually he learned that, that why is the wrong question, and he started to ask in God what? What instead? So for us, what is God wanting us to learn from the affliction that he has allowed to come into our lives? Right? What, what, what does he want us to learn from this? Not, not why. The why isn't important. What does he want us to learn from this affliction? And whatever it is, if it's, if it's loss of a loved one, if it's cancer, or if it's being let go from your job right before retirement time, whatever it might be, don't waste your affliction. Mm -hmm. Don't waste your affliction. Grow from it. Grow from it. That's the point. Stay humble. Stay prayed up. And keep giving God praise no matter what. Why do I say that? Because His grace is sufficient for you. And his strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. God, we thank you so much for your word to us tonight. We live in troubling times. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing things happen nowadays that, that many of us thought we would never see. We're living through and experiencing things that, that we have read about in Scripture that would happen, and, and here they are. These times are upon us that we know that we're living in the last days. But so were the apostles 2,000 years ago. But as we see what's happening, the trials, the tribulations, and, and, and these ongoing pandemics we, we see the the, the, the the first steps and the trial runs of one world governments one world religion we see all these things begin to take place we're if we're not careful we might grow to despair and we start to wonder what what are we to do? Your word tells us what to do. We're told to be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplications, make our requests known to you. And you'll give us peace. 
Father, some in this room are, are in the midst of affliction right now or coming out of different types of afflictions. And there's all types of afflictions. There's financial affliction. There's physical uh, uh, afflictions. There's emotional. And just there's on and on. And, and, and Father, the pain is real. The hurt is real. But so are you. And your word has told us tonight plainly, your grace is sufficient for whatever we're facing today. Your grace will be sufficient for whatever we face tomorrow. And your grace will be sufficient for us if, if you tarry another 20, 30, 50, 100 years, whatever it might be. God, we thank you for the gift of affliction. We may not like it. We may not appreciate it while we're in the midst of it. But once it's run its course, and once we, once we have learned what you've warned us to learn, we are grateful for it. The saying goes, what doesn't kill us only makes us stronger. I think that applies to the gift of affliction. When you work in our lives in these mysterious ways. So God, I do pray for our church. I pray that we'd be a faithful church. That we'd be a church that, that always looks to you. That we rely on you for all things. That we'd be known as a, a humble church. That we'd be known as a church that believes in prayer. That we'd be known as a church that, that gives you praise. But Father, the only way that we can be that kind of church is if we're those kind of people. So God, make us into the type of church that you want us to be. Thank you for the gift of affliction. Thank you for the grace that we have received through Christ. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.